Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today I want to talk about adaptation. I want to talk about the Dresden Files TV show adaptation of the Dresden Files books. And the reason I'm doing this, and it's, it's something I generally don't do, it's because I saw a video by another YouTuber, uh, Daniel Green, who talked about the Dresden Files as a bad adaptation and a so-so TV show. And in fact, you know, if you're going to talk about the two different elements, whether it is a good adaptation or a bad adaptation, whether it is a good show or a bad show, that is to my mind, actually a great way to approaching this because they're not necessarily the same thing. But what I wanted to address, instead of going through and sort of uh, the points by point that he raised, what I'd prefer to do is sort of group some of the points to talk about how they correspond to different aspects of adaptation and some of the mistakes that we make quite often, not only when we're looking at older work, but when we're trying to evaluate whether an adaptation is good or bad, because adaptation is complex. I, you know, well, obviously I think a lot of things are complex, narrative being one of them, but adaptation is complex. It's not any one thing. And I want to talk about some of the, the things that we, we can do as fans of written work that trip us up when we come to evaluating the adaptation, because our choice of evaluation is based on a set of criteria. Those criteria may be particular to ourselves or maybe general criteria but it's not a set of fixed points we choose what we are giving value to and for some reason in the uh, sort of literary community and um, for the past number of years there has been this fixation on fidelity to text must be the only measure of an adaptation and Obviously, I have other videos on this where I disagree with this position because there are other considerations that must be borne. And this, I think, uh, Daniel Green's video uh, and the Dresden Files TV show, I think is a really good case study for this kind of discussion. Because hopefully, you know, it was 2007. Tempers have cooled since then. Let's have a talk about it. Uh, slightly less passionately and slightly more um, cognitively. Let's approach it as a, a, an exercise in thought. So one of the first things is it has to do with looking at work from a previous era with our eyes today. And this causes a huge number of problems. Because while there's a, an old adage, hindsight is 2020, there is a problem sometimes when we look in the past and we're not paying attention to the details. We're also assuming knowledge from now and retrospectively applying it to the past. And also we're not taking account of changes in genre norms, uh, media norms, changes in technology, uh, changes in information. We're taking our information and our uh, experience today, jumping back in time to evaluate it as if the thing was released today. And this causes issues. So an example of this is um, the casting of Paul Blackthorne as Harry Dresden. And Daniel Green raised the point, why wasn't James Marsters cast? Everyone loves James Marsters. He's the voice of the audiobooks. He does an amazing job by about book three of the audiobooks of really getting into the, the character. He'd be fantastic. And he was a star at the time. He could have been cast. And that all makes perfect sense. If you overlook some very key salient details, the first being... James Marsters recorded the first audiobook for Audible in 2008. This TV show was in production in 2006 and broadcast in 2007. So this was before James Marsters had anything to do with the Dresden Files. This was before James Marsters, by about book three and book four of the audiobook, really got into character. That's all happening after the show was cast. No one knew James Marsters was associated with the Dresden Files. That association didn't happen. But for us now, listening to the series, we go, oh, but he would have been perfect. 
he would have, but back in 2006, no one could have predicted that. No one knew that. That was not on the cards. That's all knowledge from today that we're retrospectively applying when it, people back then couldn't possibly have known that. And the second thing is, why cast Paul Blackthorne um, rather than someone like James Marsters. Let's talk about the practical considerations of adaptation and how they go to fidelity. The character of Harry Dresden is meant to be tall. He is, well, between six foot five and six foot nine, depending on the book. It kind of varies slightly. I think in one of the later books, he's, he specifically says he's six foot nine. James Marsters is five foot seven. If you want a physically accurate form of Harry Dresden. It's going to be very difficult to find someone who's six foot nine who's going to fulfill all the other criteria. However, you can go with generally tall, so six foot three, Paul Blackthorne, six foot three, that's taller than average. He's going to look tall in comparison to a lot of the other actors. That will get across Harry's height. James Marsters being five foot seven, not so much. That's nearly a foot shorter than Harry is meant to be. Now, this is not a major problem for a lot of fandoms. We've had uh, Wolverine is meant to be tiny, but was played by Hugh Jackman, who again is over six feet. But that is making the character who is a superhero bigger and therefore more masculine and stronger, as opposed to taking someone who is meant to be very tall, meant to be quite physically imposing, and making them much shorter. We saw uh, this with the adaptation of Jack Reacher, starring Tom Cruise. A lot of the Jack Reacher fans were very dissatisfied with the casting of Cruise, not because of his acting ability, but because he just couldn't physically embody the role of Jack Reacher, who is meant to be huge. Whereas if it is a much bigger character, there, there is a different physicality to it. So there's two reasons why. James Marsters wasn't cast and wasn't even considered for the role back in 2007. And it's, it's not particularly inconceivable and it's not ignoring what was going on. It's just our knowledge of what happened post 2008 is irrelevant for the consideration of the adaptation at the time, taking into consideration the context of the actual development. And I think that is an important point. It also goes to the point raised about the camera work in it. The budget for this show was a very small budget show. This was comparable to things like Forever Night and Moonlight and those sorts of shows that were made on a very limited budget. But for today's audience, looking back on this show from 2007, we tend to judge it by the, our experience of contemporary television, what we are watching now. And we forget that computer generated effects, film technology, style of direction, the money being poured into TV, all of these things have changed quite radically over the last 15 years. There has been a renaissance in making really good television, making television cinematic, because what we used to see in television was you had cinema was where you saw beautiful camera work, where you saw exquisite sets, where you saw all of the money that had been poured into these things. And television with its limited budget and old style cameras and old style sets just couldn't compete. But now with the advent of much more sophisticated technology that's much cheaper, we've seen television suddenly accelerate to become visually more like cinema. And so when we look back on older TV shows, we suddenly go, this is absolutely terrible looking. But if we do look back at all of the TV shows from in and around that era, there are very few that stick out uh, as being visually impressive. And then when we actually look at the ones that are visually impressive, they are typically not on broadcast network TV. They're on subscription cable because, again, this is all before the idea of streaming on demand happened, before video on demand happened. 
on both of those things, those technologies that have become ubiquitous now were in their infancy back then. And one of the big knock-on effects of this is when you're making a TV show for broadcast television, as opposed to for a streaming service, it actually affects the narrative structures that you employ. If you have a streaming service or a video on demand service where you can watch the episodes anytime, there is an opportunity to do long form story arcs where every episode runs into the next to tell one giant arc. However, if you're on broadcast television where there is no opportunity except on the odd occasion of a rerun or a catch up week that was specifically programmed, that if you missed one week, they still wanted you to tune in the next week. Now, imagine if there was no ability to rewatch any of Game of Thrones, that if one episode aired one week and then the next episode, another episode aired. And there was never an opportunity, if you missed one week, that you could see the second episode. And so you watched episode one and you're now watching episode three. You don't know what happened in episode two. People have told you, but you haven't experienced it. And if you miss another episode, then what's the point of watching the whole season? Because you've now lost all of these chunks that things don't make sense anymore. There were key elements happened in each episode to join them all together. And if you don't have the opportunity to rewatch them, to watch them after you missed when they first aired, then suddenly the entire season arc falls apart. And a lot of people then don't watch, they don't follow. And that's the problem that broadcast TV had. If you missed a couple of weeks for whatever reason, and you as a television executive still wanted them to tune back in, that's why episodic narratives are so popular on broadcast. That's why they dominated broadcast television. And so taking something like the Dresden Files, instead of taking book one and doing an entire season arc based on book one, the decision was made to make it episodic. And you might go, oh, well, that's going to be a bad adaptation then. Au contraire, because let's think about what they were actually adapting. The Dresden Files is a series that has a central character and in the books, there is a major event that cropped up that year, but that's the focus of the book. But one of the premises of the entire series is time doesn't just skip forward. Harry lives a life between books. And in that time frame, because we have side jobs, we have the short stories that show that Harry takes additional cases. And these aren't the be all end all big massive uh, events that happen in the novels. Most of these are actually quite mundane. And so this is the perfect thing to adapt because you can imagine the structure that they wanted to use, which is we will have an episodic TV show based on a whole load of different supernatural cases that Harry's going to investigate. And then once per season, we're going to have a big double episode or a big special episode where we focus on one of the books. And remember, back in 2007, we're only, what, five, six books in. It's, they don't have an entire series of books yet. They only have the first few. That's what they're adapting. So looking at it from our perspective, going, oh, but there's all of these things and they could have done those things. Those things hadn't been considered yet. The arcs with Susan Rodriguez had not been conceived of or finalized in any printed word. They didn't exist yet. What the adaptation team had, what the creative team had, was this idea of a wizard detective. And when we think of shows like uh, The X-Files or even BBC's Merlin, they are constructed in an episodic narrative so that there is a monster of the week, a problem of the week to be solved. And it's going to fit in with the world. And then there will be big event shows. There will be a double episode, a mid-season finale or a season finale episode that will focus on the big event that everything builds towards. And doing that is not 
ignoring what is going on in the books. Even if your idea of what you want in a TV show is, well, I just want to see the book on screen. That's great. As a book reader, quite often that's what we want. Adaptations are not made for the book readers. The book readers are already fans. TV adaptations are generally made for a broader, more mainstream audience. And because of that, they repackage and repurpose the books into a form that they believe is going to be more palatable for a mainstream audience. And this is a really important point. Just because they're doing that does not mean they are disrespecting or ignoring the books. That's not the point. They see how popular the books are. They go, that is great. Let's use part of that as a base, but we want to reach more people because we love this. We want to share it with more people. But if in its current form, it's not reaching those people, let's use a different medium. Let's change the story slightly to make it more palatable to a mainstream audience. And if they enjoy it, they will go out and buy the books. And that's one of the best things about TV and film adaptations. They encourage more people to go back to the source material. And one of the reasons why we know that all of these creative teams are actually, you know, quite like the books is because they are almost always at pains to throw in elements, little Easter eggs that only book fans can pick up on. They throw in elements to cater directly to the book fans as an acknowledgement. But for some reason in the modern day, book fans seem to think that adaptation should be made solely for them and should just be the book on the screen and ignore the fact that the screen is a different medium with different narrative rules and different narrative structures and different narrative constructs. And so things have to be changed. And this is where we get on to the idea of fidelity. Now, one of the points that Daniel Green raised was, why did they change the car? The VW Beetle, the, the bug that Harry drives. It's a beat up thing and it's an iconic vehicle that he drives around for the first number of books. And they replaced it with a Jeep. Why did they do that? That's inconceivable. Well, there's no good reason for that. Well, in fact, there are lots of really good reasons for that. Number one, the person cast, uh, Paul Blackthorne, is six foot two, or well, six foot three. Him getting out of a VW Beetle was going to look really awkward. And therefore, anytime you needed Harry to get out of the car, to jump out of the car and go and do something, was going to look incredibly awkward as this very tall man was scrambling out of a tiny car. Now, in the book, it's funny because Jim Butcher can just say, oh, he leapt out of the car, ignoring the physical reality of a very tall person getting a very tiny car, which is actually like clowns getting out of a tiny clown car. It's totally dissonant. And when you're putting it up on the screen, it would look ridiculous. So that's one point. The second point is it's a TV show and therefore cameras have to be placed inside the car so they can film them while driving. They can film the interior of the car. Sound equipment has to be put in and there has to be room for at least two people to sit there in case Harry is driving with a passenger. Now, you can't do that with a VW Beetle and someone who is six foot three. It, it is physically impossible unless you take something that looks kind of like a VW Beetle and change it so it becomes a huge car, in which case then it is superficially looking like a VW Beetle, but isn't a VW Beetle. So what did the producers do? They replaced the VW Beetle with a beat up old Jeep. Why that thing? And then we remember the reason Harry drives the Beetle is it is an old style mechanical vehicle with no electronics. It is easy for a mechanic to fix and it is less likely to be damaged by his magic if he uses magic. That is the reason he is driving the VW Beetle. So what did the producers replace his car with for the considerable uh, practical reasons of we need to put camera equipment in it and not make him look ridiculous if he ever steps out of it they replaced it with a similar vehicle one that is heavily mechanical and not electronic they were actually paying attention to why harry does that and you only get that from being faithful 
to the actual concepts of the novel, not just their superficial dressing. And that is an incredibly important point. It's looking beyond a superficial fidelity and actually looking for conceptual fidelity a narrative fidelity, paying attention to the narrative reason something is there, not just, well, it was in the book and it was described that way, so it should be that way. That is a very surface level interpretation of the information. And something as a cosmetic change, i.e. changing the shape of the vehicle from a VW Beetle to a Jeep, when you adhere to the reason why it is done that way, is actually faithful adaptation, not ignoring the books. And this goes to the point about Bob the Skull as well. Back in 2007, how were they going to do Bob the Skull as an interesting character in the show? CGI was not an option, not only on the budget that they were on, but also CGI wouldn't have worked for a regular character because Bob was integral to what they wanted to show on the show. He's integral to the books. He was integral to the show. What is Bob's narrative function in the novels? Butcher literalized the well Bob conversation because Bob is an exposition machine. He is there to have expositionary dialogue with Harry to explain things, to further the plot, to move things along. He is a literalized trope. And Butcher gives him incredible character uh, over the course of all of these novels. But again, Bob's character evolves over the course of multiple novels. And this show only ran for one season. It never got renewed. So they replaced Bob, the spirit of intellect that is imprisoned basically in a skull, with a human soul, a sorcerer, who was incredibly knowledgeable, therefore we can see the intellect link, and his soul, his spirit, spirit of intellect, is imprisoned in the soul for being bad as a punishment he has to serve. Now, doesn't that seem a lot conceptually like what was done with Bob in the first few books? So why would they do this? I've mentioned CGI wasn't an option, animatronics would have looked very, very silly. What we then get is a human actor who can perform the same plot function, who can perform the same narrative function, and who is conceptually very, very similar to Bob the Skull from the books. But not only that, because he is a human actor, the actor, uh, Paul Blackthorne, was able to have actual dialogue scenes with another human being, the way that actors are taught to do. Practical consideration. You get more out of a scene when actors are comfortable and develop a rapport. That is harder to do if he was talking to an animatronic skull. It, it just, talk to any or listen to any of the interviews with the, the actors who had to interact with Muppets or had to interact with blue screen or green screen and how difficult it was to try to get their performances when there was no one there, when they were talking to a tennis ball on a stick. It's much easier when there's another person there that you can interact with. But not only that, for a TV audience, it gave a face and a personality to this character. And it had this, the character of Bob had the same limitations basically that Bob the Skull had, that he was trapped in the skull, he could occasionally leave it um, for a limited period of time, and also uh, they could develop it further that he could possess someone. All of those things were potentials because again, this is the first season. This is establishing a lot of the little baselines before the world gets developed. And so there was a lot of opportunity to do that later on. And this was just the start. So replacing Bob the Skull with an actual soul of a human magician who'd been punished, that makes a lot of practical sense, conceptually ties into a lot of the stuff that they were doing with Bob in the books. But even more than that, performs exactly the same narrative function that Bob did in the books. It's actually a really close adaptive change and it makes a lot of sense. And what is even more interesting is thematically, this is something that is an aspect of Harry in the books, his troubled childhood, the lure of the dark side of magic, the lure of, of dark magic and how that he tr straddles that gray area sometimes and is tempted 
Bob in the show as a sorcerer who fell to the dark side and was punished and imprisoned ties into that thematically. And that actually is very clever and is an excellent adaptive choice. And I think works very, very well, even though superficially different. The difference isn't the problem. It's actually quite well done. So then let's think about um, Susan as a character who's introduced and in this she's working as a waitress. That Susan. Now, interestingly enough, um, the act, female actors playing uh, Susan and uh, Ka uh, Karen Murphy, although in the show she's called Connie Murphy, talk about that in a minute. But when they were auditioning, they auditioned for the other roles because if you think about them physically, they actually look like the other person, the other character. But the casting director really liked the actor who ends up being cast as Connie Murphy for that role. Uh, they thought that she had the best sort of dynamic to bring to that character. So physically, they are the opposites of what they should be. They, they should be the other way around. And yet, in terms of personality, it worked really well. But one of the interesting things about um, Susan's character is in the books, um, when we meet her she is an investigative journalist for it's like the midwestern arcane or the midwestern arcana something like that a, a supernatural newspaper but when we meet her in this opening episode of the the tv show she's a waitress in a diner and you're like why did they change her character that way this is before a lot of the events later on in the show and a, later on in the series so what if the events of these first few episodes or this first season are the things that made Susan leave her job as a, as a waiter and become an investigated journalist who specialized in the arcane and in the supernatural? Could we not look at this as an origin story to give her character more to do over the course of a series in which there are going to be more investigative elements because it's going to be an episodic series and therefore she can become a regular guest star and she can move from being a waiter to becoming the character in the books so in practical terms you've taken a character and given them an arc instead of taking a character that has no progression for an entire season you actually give the character progression for an entire season, much in the same way that Harry starts off slightly less powerful here than he was in Stormfront. And we can get to see him get progressively stronger over the season, the way that he does in the books. But in the books, that powering up is usually quite substantial each and every book. Now we're going to see it on a much more granular and slow progressive reason. Again, because this is going to be a season of lots of adventures. And if he got massively powerful after every one, then that ruins the suspense and the tension that you would create. So it's actually a very clever decision to make him less powerful at the beginning to show him building up. It's the same thing with the wards. The wards are torn down from the inside, which makes them ineffective. And this is something we see time and time again in the book series, that Harry thinks his defenses are fine. And then something comes along that shows him that he's forgotten something or they are not as powerful as he thought. And therefore he redesigns them yet again. This is a recurring element of the books. And it's really cool that they added that in, in this very first episode. <laughs> and. I have to think like for, for something that had such a small budget, they've managed to tie in so many of the concepts of the Dresden universe, that narrative universe, that story world, they've managed to tie it in so very well and made it engaging and interesting in a way that someone who was a casual viewer of the X-Files could follow, that someone who was a casual viewer of any of these sort of supernatural shows could follow along. And so I think, a lot of this actually works incredibly well. And it's trying to remember superficial fidelity is the least important aspect. And quite often conceptual, subtextual, uh, structural or functional fidelity plays a big part. But one of the reasons why 
this as an adaptation didn't go with Stormfront because they adapted Stormfront as one of the episodes. Stormfront was heavily CGI, um, uh, required a lot of CGI. And when it came to airtime, although they had the principal photography done, they'd cut it into place. They were still waiting on a number of the special effects to be added. It wasn't ready for air. So it was shown out of sequence. We've seen this with Firefly as well. Uh, we've seen it with a number of shows where the pilot, the thing that they wanted to do, uh, the, the big special episode that was going to be best foot forward, isn't ready to be shown because there were stand-in effects or there were things that they want to tweak now for a TV audience rather than showing it to network execs that they were trying to sell the show to. And so they did adapt book one and because it was a TV show, because it's trimmed down to fit the uh, time frame of the TV show, i.e. the runtime, some things had to be changed, some things had to be removed, but the essence of the story was the same. But I think one of the, the big aspects that Daniel Green touched on was that the character of Harry was not consistent. And I would have to disagree with this. I think the portrayal of Harry by Paul Blackthorne, how it was written, is actually very consistent. So the first thing is there's a, a small scene where um, Harry is obviously in bed with Susan. He's having a casual sexual relationship with Susan, the waitress from across the road who works in the diner. Yeah, Dre Dresden has a problem in the series with the male gaze, and that is a whole aspect. It has been talked to death. It's not important. The series does improve in those regards, but it, it's there from the beginning. And remember, they're only being able to see the first few books where this was a problem in the books. But not only that, Dresden is a detective. The whole tone and structure of the early novels is based on detective noir. It's based on those tropes. Dresden is a detective noir character of which womanizing is one of the aspects. It's one of the recognizable tropes of that genre. And obviously Butcher develops it in later books that weren't available at the time of the adaptation. And certainly this characteristic was present in all of the ones that they were looking at. So this is a way to show Harry is single, but has uh, relationships. He is a detective. It's a recognizable trope. It puts audiences at ease because they recognize this as a type of detective. Therefore, putting in the strangeness of him being a wizard is already grounded by a different element. If you're introducing a fantastic element for a general audience, then having a grounded element they recognize is usually beneficial because it helps ground the fantastical element and aids their willing suspension of disbelief. It is a very standard narrative technique and anyone who understands anything about storytelling, it recognizes this. So the that sequence is easily explained and it brings in the whole tension that we are going to have develop across the entirety of the show between Susan and Karen, the two important women in Harry's life at this point. This is something from the books. It's developed in a slightly different way, but again, structurally, we're talking about episodic nature, so it's a lot of the, the side jobs are going to be happening, and you're going to have these two different female guest stars. So it's putting in that beloved trope of a love triangle where there are competing love interests for a single person. You mightn't love the trope, absolutely fine, but it's there for a reason because it allows uh, writers to put in tension in scenes that may require a bit of tension. But the next sequence I want to talk about is Harry's treatment of the young boy. Now, um, in this scene, the young boy walks up to Harry with a bit of paper he's torn out from the yellow pages because we are told that Harry advertises in the yellow pages. He's taken out an ad. It's there as a wizard detective with no parties, no blah, 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 balloon animals, whatever it is. But it's the funny thing that is repeated multiple times in the early books. It's a nod to the book fans. But not only that, it has Harry's name, it has Harry's address, and it has his phone number. And where does the young kid meet him? He meets him outside the diner opposite Harry's apartment where he's just watched Harry walk out of and cross to Harry's car, which is parked across the road. So the child has the address, has seen someone emerge from the address and stand and look at the car. 
and that's why he walks up and says are you Harry Dresden are you him like with the little bit of paper because he's seen him leave from that that place therefore it's not insane this is actually very believable and of course if it hadn't been Harry if it had been someone that Harry would know uh, that's his place there and they would have pointed because the kid has the address on the bit of paper I know that people don't generally use phone books anymore but phone books have name address and bit of paper, uh, name, address and phone number. But not only that, we are specifically told he took out an advertisement that contains this information. That's why the paper isn't just a little slim fit. It's a little chunk because it's meant to be Harry's ad. But, you know, I, I can appreciate that people don't pay attention to the actual details that are in the novel and in the show. And it's understandable that people miss things like that. We all miss obvious things sometimes but what we have here is the difference between reader knowledge and character knowledge because uh, daniel green had a problem with the fact that harry when he hears this kid sob story about i'm there are these monsters pursuing me here's all this money help me and harry reassures this kid there are no monsters and it's how can harry say that we've had all these flashbacks showing that there are monsters you know, but this goes to harry's character Harry, as we know from the books, and as we see in the TV show, recognizes that 99.99% of all children in the world do not have supernatural monsters stalking them. Only very rare or very special children have monsters stalking them. That's the whole point. That's why he's not constantly in demand, because the interaction of the supernatural world with the real world is a tension, and the supernatural world tries to keep itself separate so when a child comes up to harry dresden and says here's here's all my money i need you to help me harry does the decent thing which is no 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 kid there aren't any real monsters he's reassuring a child because it's a child and we have seen this kindness in harry's character throughout the books he might be a bit gruff he might be grumpy but his heart is always in the right place and to take advantage of a child would be antithetical to the construction of harry dresden as a character but because of the flashbacks because we have seen this glimpse of harry being plagued by actual supernatural elements that's why harry calls in a favor and checks up on the kid because while he's almost absolutely certain there aren't supernatural elements, because why would there be? He wants to make 100% certain, so calls in a favor. Again, this ties into what we saw in the flashbacks, the fact that he is empathizing and sympathizing with the child, but also looking out for the child and not trying to take advantage of them. The people Harry takes advantage of for money are those rich people who have money to throw away, where he doesn't mind taking advantage of adults who have a whole load of money and they're not going to miss his small fee. But to take advantage of a child is not what Harry Dresden stands for. And so this is actually a very clever articulation of the actual character. And it makes perfect sense in terms of the character. Is it perfectly handled? No, it's, it's not a particularly good TV show. It's, it's a cheap TV show that they were trying to get a lot done in. So I think a lot of this comes down to this idea that because we've read all of the books, we know Harry intimately for a lot longer and for a, a lot more significant part of his arc. And we take all of that knowledge. And when we look at the early uh, rendition of his character on screen, we can go, but that's not who Harry is because we know him for multiple books. But if we go back and just read Stormfront, ignoring, and I know it's very difficult to do this, but ignore everything that happens after Stormfront. Look at Harry in that book and you go, what they put on screen there is actually very close to Harry. What they put in terms of his apartment, his level of power, what he is capable of, the fact that his relationship with Karen Murphy is more transactional in the first books. They become friends later 
his relationship with Susan is a lot more complicated in the early books it and becomes even more complicated later but all of these things later book knowledge can change our appreciation of trying to see it with fresh eyes from the first page and you know this is it's something that uh, it's one of the reasons why authors hire editors a fresh pair of eyes because if you've read something over and over and over again you no longer see the words on the page you understand the meaning behind them without even seeing what's there anymore and you read into it a lot more and you have all of this background knowledge but none of that is available in trying to communicate this to a first-time audience and that's what this show was doing. This episode communicates a lot of the different aspects very well to a first time audience. And not only that, sets it up with Harry with a small level of power, slightly troubled background, something strange in his background, but with room to grow and explore. So a number of different plot hooks, the relationship with his dad and how that was slightly odd and different. Again, something that plays into Harry's need for father figures, his need to be a father figure or retreat from that, his associations with family. That is set up in this episode. The fact that the supernatural world is rare and rarely interacts with the human world, that is set up in this uh, episode. We have the introduction of Susan with a potential plot arc for her to become the Susan of the books incrementally over the series. That is set up in this. We see the relationship with Karen and how he's not automatically called into every single crime scene. He's called in occasionally and a lot of the other police officers don't like it they don't like him karen's the only one that speaks to him and that relationship is initially set up in this so much of this is an excellent adaptation of the dresden universe such care and attention to detail has been taken to make sure that you can't do an animatronic bob so why not? What is the next best thing? What are the practical considerations? How can we do what the thing Bob does in the books? How can we do that thing that Bob is meant to be doing in the show? They thought about it. They can't use the VW bug. So they used the next best thing, something that was conceptually the same. Why didn't they cast those actors? Those actors weren't involved at the time. Those actors weren't involved or associated with the project at the time. Why was it filmed in a certain way? That was the level of technology available. Those were the standard techniques used, particularly for a show that had such a limited budget. All of these things make sense. All of these things tie into a consideration of, yes, they were trying to make the best adaptation possible for a different narrative structure with different levels of technology for a different audience. And it all works. It is an exceptionally good adaptation in all of those regards it is a bad adaptation if your expectation is they're going to take stormfront and put it on the screen if that is your expectation this is a bad adaptation but that is not the only way to adapt something and i hope after following through all of this that you've enjoyed this discussion because there are different ways of thinking about adaptation Adaptation is not just one thing. And adapting a book series can be about changing it in such a way to evoke a sense of the series and then have special episodes that focus particularly on aspects of the book. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. And I'll see you in the next one.